Hi and welcome to PsyQ. Well, if there's one thing we know President Trump hates more than science, it's reporters. And so I've brought in two science reporters into the studio who must be the most hated people in the White House. They're here to talk about the intersection of science and journalism and how we can help engage the public in understanding the role of science in decision making, in the environment and in global policy. Our first guest is a good friend of mine, Aston Mattis. She is the co-creator of the up-and-coming network, The Human Network, which aims to democratize information. Her writing appears in The Atlantic, The New York Times, and she's also the author of the memoir, The Girl in the Woods. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. And now Mike Goecki tackles the environment head on as a journalist for Monga Bay, which is an excellent publication and was named one of the top green publications in the world. You also have a publication in Indonesia, which is where I used to live for a while. So I'm sure you write often in Indonesian. <laughs> <laughs> You're also the host of the Monga Bay podcast. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jade. So my first question is to you, Mike, because you write about the environment a lot of the time and sometimes environment policy. But I heard from our President Trump that we only need to save a little bit of the environment and that it's not actually that important. So why is your journalism important? Why cover science? Why cover the environment? Yeah, well, if, you know, if Donald Trump said it, it must be true, right? So, um, uh, you know, we're obviously living in a time with unprecedented environmental challenges and uh, the foremost one, of course, being climate change, which is an existential crisis for our entire species. And, um, you know, we're, there's also quite a bit of evidence that we are possibly living in an era of the sixth mass extinction on a global scale. Um, so I'd say there are numerous challenges that we need to rise to and, and um, deal with as a species, really, in, in terms of how, you know, we, we possibly have already exceeded the carrying capacity of our planet. So. These are things that should concern us, and um, more directly to his assertion that we only need to conserve a little bit of the environment. You know, um, eminent biologist and conservationist E.O. Wilson has his Half Earth Initiative, which essentially says if we were to set aside half of the planet as protected areas, we could conserve about 80% of biodiversity. So, um, you know, I think that's a more realistic conservation goal than a little bit. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, in, in the service of helping us grope our way towards solutions to these problems, I think that's why science journalism, environmental science journalism is so key today. I think a few of our listeners might agree with you over our President Trump. Now, Aspen, you also write on a tough topic. I've read your piece about the future of work and what's going to happen when AI takes our jobs. Why do you think covering those challenges is relevant to people? Yeah, well, I think there are two ways of looking at the um, the fact that basically machinery is more productive, it's much more efficient than humanity that's created that machinery at accomplishing tasks of production. There's one way of looking at it which is really dismal, like, oh my God, we're all gonna lose our jobs as if that were like losing our meaning or our purpose or our like um our livelihood our life and there's another way of looking at it which is much more um uplifting and actually practical and empowering which is with increased efficiency we have increased freedom and we no longer have to you know you and i no longer have to farm in order to eat we no longer need to hunt in order to survive we're, it's no longer, we're no longer at the level of subsistence. We're no longer existing at a level of subsistence where the human purpose or objective is mere survival. We've transcended the subsistence existence, which is so exciting. And now we get to do things like write books <laughs> and, you know, paint paintings and... Um, go on vacation. Yeah, yeah, go to beautiful places that we find inspiring and um, investigate the nature of what we are and the nature of reality um, through inquiry, which we call science. Yeah. You know, so really the questions to ask are not, how do we stop machines from being more productive than humans? Because that's absurd. And that's not actually what we really want anyway. The real questions are, 
how can we use our leisure time or our, you know, basically our lives other than in rote livelihood. Yeah. Our life is no longer survival. Yeah. Now we get to choose. We have the freedom, which is so um, exciting and such a privilege and such a gift. Now, you're, the way you cover science is really interesting because you didn't come from this question of AI and technology from the point of what is the tech, what's, the, what's inside the box. You look at it from a human perspective, and that comes across in a lot of your writing. Why do you think it's important to cover these technical questions, scientific questions from the human perspective? Well, all of this technology is the creation of humanity. You know, like we are telecommunicating via text, mm -hmm. via the phone. It's not like the future anymore. It's the reality that we have created through our innovative um, mind, you know? Yeah. It's really exciting. And it is only a means. It is only a tool. Like, technology is neither good nor evil. Yeah. It is a medium through which to communicate or through which to uh, vilify and disconnect. We have now in place globally a system of connection, the internet, it's a global net, and it is potentially a means of humanizing humans. And that's what we can and will use it for. I'm glad you mentioned the internet too. Mm -hmm. And I'm so interested to have the two of you sitting next to each other because you're, from the human perspective, you cover a lot of hard science and new research. It's quite complex. And both of you distribute your work partly via the internet. So uh, Mike, how do you take this kind of complicated, the publications that are coming out, you know, they're not being read by the average person that would also read USA Today. So. What do you? What process do you go through to make sure that this information is relevant to ordinary people? Yeah, it's uh, it's that's certainly the challenge when you cover really hard sciences like we do at Manga Bay. Um, you know, it. But I think I think in the end the the answer is really like with any good journalism. You know, there has to be a, a story. There has to be a narrative that you're telling and and. Um, you know those kind of points of entry for people to really be able to put themselves in in the place of someone in the story that you're telling. Um, so that that's always that's always key. You know, is not to just cover the facts, which of course is is the the main point. And of you know, you want to be entirely focused on representing the science, and that and that can be quite difficult because they are really difficult, complex topics to to try to encapsulate in 800 to 1,000 words. You know. And, um, and of course, science is, is always evolving. Our theories are always being refined. It's, it's never a settled matter. And so there's often quite a debate that also maybe needs to be represented in there. You know, you never have a very pat story, in other words, when you're reporting on, on science. But, um, but, you know, the way you make it relatable to people is just keeping that, that human element, you know, the, 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 having the narrative that people can find accessible. I want to talk to you both about where you draw that line between journalism and entertainment because you have to make your work interesting to people, but you also want to make sure that the information is true. And we see so many, um, you know, see it on CNN all the time, especially on like morning shows. They'll say, you know, a study shows that chocolate helps you lose weight. And that may be the case, but the study is clearly, you know, not the best of the best research. Where do you, how do you choose just what you write about and how do you balance the information versus entertainment? Well, I find nothing is more compelling to humans than the truth and getting at what is actually real. And that is by our nature as like, as people, like fascinating. Like we want to understand what we are, how, you know, like our access to power, our access to um, like transcending limits. And that's what um, better understanding of the nature of reality gives us. I like your point about uncertainty because that's something that a lot of scientists have a really hard time communicating. And a lot of science journalists have a hard time communicating as well, being like, we think it's this and then there's 99% chance of this or there's a risk of that. 
how do you, Amai, cover that when you're reporting on a study and they've got uncertainty embedded in there? How do you communicate that in a way that people can comprehend? Yeah, that's, that's certainly something that I feel like is being discussed a lot now, even among scientists. I've spoken with a number of scientists who are really starting to discuss this idea that, you know, the, in, in our, in our times right now, it's very much a, a part of like the popular debate that you know should how much should scientists be coming forward and speaking about their work to the public. And one of the reasons why a lot of scientists have traditionally been a little reluctant to do that is because of this certainty, you know, uh, this yeah. uncertainty. You know, like no scientist is ever really certain of anything because they understand all too well that someone could come along and com completely demolish everything they think that their certainty was based on. Um, and so how to express this certainty is a thing that I think scientists are, are wrestling a lot with these days. And and just, sorry, I would say releasing, uh, d like decoupling certainty from virtue. It's not, there's no such thing as truth with a capital T for humanity. Like we do not, that is not the nature of our relationship yeah. with knowledge. Yeah, but unfortunately, when it comes time to make policy, there needs to be some basis to it. And so that's, uh, you know, that's their fear is that if they come speak with any uncertainty, it's, it, you know, like Aspen's saying, it's, it's almost stigmatized to be uncertain about something. And, and, uh, but in the scientific community, that's, that's not the case at all. Certainty is more stig stigmatized probably in the scientific community. So I think that is, uh, that is certainly a unique challenge of, of science journalism is how to present the the uncertainty in a way that makes it seem like yet and yet we are refining our theories you know we, we are we are finding some some kernels of truth here and there are worthwhile lessons to be learned here um, you know I, I mean I think it, it it just really comes down to the uh, you know journalistic ethics basically it's like uh, who is it Carl Bernstein who the of course the you know Watergate journalist um, he, he has a phrase that he likes to use about journalism being finding the the best obtainable version of the truth and I think that really is apropos to this question you know because it's you know there there has to be almost like an implicit acknowledgement that this isn't the truth but this is perhaps just like science and journalism I think are both in a way a search for the best obtainable version of the truth as opposed to the truth and so um, you know I, I think if, when you stick to stick to journalistic ethics just like a scientist will stick to their, you know, ethics of verifiability and, and uh, you know, the, the other ethics that go into how they conduct their experiments and, and you know, come up with their theories, um, you know, that's, that's the best way to navigate it, I think. I want and to talk about how that is impacted by the, the changing news cycle and the way that media has changed, but more importantly and more recently, I think, is the current administration. And I want to talk to you about how the current administration, the policies that are coming out of our new presidency are impacting your work. I mean, Aspen, you're launching an entire network, yeah, partly in response to the way that we're doing things today. Yeah, I wouldn't say that my that the human okay, I wouldn't say that the human network is a reaction to our government or any policy that's come out of it, but more a reaction to people um, the need for, you know, the current need on planet Earth for a channel of connection, for news that is the signal without the noise. Because all of the media we currently have access to through newspapers and magazines and television, really all media that is hitting us is essentially glorified gossip. It is, I'm not here to make friends. It is there are some other across some border who is somehow lesser and the nature of his difference is that he is less human. And clickbait is fed by fear and fear feeds hate and hate justifies violence. And the impact of this does not end in the digital reality. It actually affects how people act in the flesh. And the impact of this is blood and it's war. And it's that America is in the longest war it has ever been in. And it is that there are global conflicts and global genocide. Now you come at this from a deeply human perspective. Mike, when you're writing, sometimes the humans are the bad guys in the story. We're causing mass extinction. 
um, were the cause of a lot of the problems. So how do you make what you do relevant to humans? How do you make them not just feel apathetic about all the bad stuff that's happening? Yeah, it's tough to cover the environment and not not get into the dooming and glooming as it's called these days. Um, I, I mean, but there's always, you know, all the work that the scientists are out there doing is aimed at, even if they're just purely trying to under, better understand the world, you know, that understanding underlies the conservation initiatives and, and um, you know, other, you know, climate action and uh, other policies that were trying to adopt to, to help minimize and mitigate our impact on the planet. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's a matter of finding, finding the people working on that and, and working on solutions because there's, there's always an interesting story to be told about someone digging into this problem, you know, and what motivates them to want to look at it and, you know, where are they coming from in their search for answers to this problem. And, uh, you know, so, so just trying to balance the as much as possible balance that bad news with you know the, the the more positive like human ingenuity of just understanding the world and looking for solutions and the optimism yeah. yeah and so wait so jade i actually don't see any disconnection between mike's um intention and and the intention of the human network i just see when you say he says humans are the villains i i don't see that i think i just reading the few pieces that i read really you're exposing humans responsibility and capability of mm -hmm. um of really innovatively addressing um a way of making a harmonious planet possible for humans and um life like yeah. the, exposing the connected nature of all life on earth yeah absolutely yeah and i i, I you know, wouldn't use the word villain, of course, to describe anybody, but certainly there are humans you out there. You mean they don't who, say villain in the data in yeah, the studies? No. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, speaking of journalistic ethics, it's generally frowned upon to <laughs> label someone a villain for what they're doing. I mean, everyone's coming, but I would generally argue coming that from a good place, I think. Even if you don't use the word villain, if you cast someone as a villain, yeah, it has certainly. the same effect, it has certainly. the same impact, it's disempowering, because then there are victims, and once you're a victim, it's a story. Yeah, and, and certainly there are plenty of people out there who don't even agree that problems that some scientists are saying are problems are problems. You know, I mean, we we live in America, so we're <laughs> well aware of how much climate denial is still around. You know, and I mean, it, it flies in the face of all the facts. But there are people who adamantly believe that climate change is not happening, or you know, their objections to it have evolved over time. Now, now you know you have the Congressman from Texas, Lamar Smith, saying that, you know, now he's come around to saying, oh, yeah, it actually is real and we are causing it, but it's going to be a good thing, you know, and which is an argument that people have been using for decades now already, you know. I want to talk to you, Mike, about Earth optimism because there's the Earth optimism movement that they just uh, had their first conference on Earth Day 2017, yeah. um, but a lot of the time there's bad news out there. Things are not going great. So, how do you, at the same time as, you know, you're reporting the news, but how do you get people to motivated to create change in the face of all of these challenges? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I think it's you know focusing on the. I mean, obviously, we we really need to be, I think, less reluctant to report on some of the the bad stuff. You know, um, I was in fact, I was you know, I was just uh, interviewing. Catherine Hayhoe, who's a climate scientist at Texas Tech University, for the Manga Bay newscast, our podcast, um, and uh, uh, you know, just just earlier this weekend, we were discussing this, and she used a metaphor that I really liked for for you know talking to people about climate science, where she was saying, you know, if if you were to go to the doctor and the doctor were to show you an X-ray of your lungs and there's black spots, they would say, you know, and and you're a smoker, they would say, you know. I'm not going to tell you you have to stop smoking because that's not my job. You know, I'm not your parent. I'm your doctor. I'm here to present, you know, my findings to you. And my findings are that you have these black spots on your lungs. Those are potentially, uh, you know, signs that you're developing cancer. And so you should probably quit smoking. And then what you choose to do with that information is up to you, you know. And um, 
And so I think, you know, when, when scientists are telling us that they're detecting these black spots on Earth's lungs, you know, we need, to, we need to take that seriously. And the public really has a right to be informed about that, and they should be informed, and we shouldn't, you know, hide any of that truth or, or sugarcoat it or soft pedal it just because we're worried that that's going to turn them off, you know? I mean, to me, if a doctor tells me that if I don't stop smoking or I'm going to die of lung cancer, that's a pretty powerful motivation, you know? Like, I don't need my doctor to tell me, oh, you know, if you exercise more, it'll be super fun and you'll, you know, you'll have great, like, I don't need that positive, you know? But at the same time, I, I, you know, this is not a perfect metaphor because you do need to, you know, and so again, you, you do need to have that positive uh, aspect to it and that optimism. And I think, again, that's where, you know, pe so many people are working on such innovative solutions and there are so many interesting human stories to tell about how they're delving into this and the research they're doing and, and the things they're finding. And, you know, and, and that's, you know, truth is stranger than fiction a lot of time. You know, I find there's great stories. You don't need to editorialize. You don't need to embellish. You, the more you dig into it, the more interesting it becomes, really, you know, and, and f representing that faithfully and, you know, I think is, is optimistic in and of itself, you know, that we can get to the bottom of this and we can, we can figure it out. It may look bleak, but we can understand this and we, that means we can come to terms with it. Building that common ground. Yeah. I want to ask you both about how you do that because, Aspen, I know you talk about connection but then there's some people out there that don't want to hear that. They're actively against what you're doing. Same to you, Mike. There's a lot of people that are like, you can't, that's not, climate change isn't real. And they'll attack your point of view. How do you build connection with those people? Yeah, so I have never experienced that, actually. I've never experienced someone who doesn't want to connect. I've never, you know, they think that they don't. But what they discover, if we just take your, your scenario, um, you don't need to tell the person who has black spots in their lungs, you should stop smoking. You don't need to manipulate them into believing that they should stop smoking. You don't need to tell them that they're bad or that they're wrong or anything. You don't need to make them wrong. All you need to discuss with them is what they're committed to. And if they discover for themselves that they're committed to living, that will be the destination that their behavior um, will be moving toward. Would that work it, for climate change skeptics? Absolutely. It's a exact, it's, this is like, basically, it's a discussion about what you envision for yourself, for the people you love, for the fate of life on Earth. Like, if there are black spots, spots on the lungs of Earth, that's a very, um, like, you know, non-confronting statement and we can look into like whatever you know um that brings up for them in terms of like well like is that um something that they would wish for earth yeah. and what do i mean this is a kind of a silly metaphor to <laughs> send in this way but really what you discover is people want the people they love to have um community and connection and safety and a future. But how do you do it when they look at the black lung example and say, those aren't black spots, they're actually, uh, they're actually benefits? How do you convince them when they are disagreeing on the same data? Well, you can find the thing that they see as the black spots on the lungs of Earth. I mean, you know, it's different. There are plenty of people who smoke and who know that they're dying because they smoke but they don't believe that they're capable of, of not smoking or they don't think it's worth it to them. Um, it's not, they're not committed to stopping smoking and you can't tell them that they're bad or wrong. There's no point in that to make them wrong. You know, that does nothing, that does no good yeah. at all. Same question to you, Mark. How do you deal with people that fundamentally disagree with the data? Yeah, yeah, I've definitely had a very different experience from Aspen. I hear from people who disagree with the data all the time. Um, you know, I just wrote an article uh, last week, I think it was, about African wild dogs and how climate change is really, they've already, you know, lost over 90% of their habitat and, and their numbers are down by 80% over the past couple decades. And, uh, you know, it's, it's mostly due to climate change. The, over the 20 year span of this study, the average temperature has gone up a degree Celsius and, and they, they can't forage for food as much. The hotter it gets, the, you know, basically, 
the, the less they'll go forage for food, which means less food for the pups. And so their pup survival rate is going down. And so that's putting these already critically endangered animals in further jeopardy because, you know, their, their young are just not as viable. And, and I got a comment, you know, in response from an anonymous person saying climate change is not killing these dogs, you know, this mythical creation by China is, is not killing them, you know, people are killing them. And it's like, well, that's actually true too, you know, <laughs> human wildlife conflict is also a problem. So if they hadn't been an anonymous commenter, I could have probably, you know, had a, had a conversation with them about that because there are, there are myriad problems that are facing almost every species. Um, but, you know, it, like, I think that's a good point. You know, that's a good example. Like a lot, some people just aren't looking for that kind of debate. They aren't looking for connection. And I don't think you should waste your time on them. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying people can't be reached, but if that's not what they're coming for, you know, I mean, I, th I think then there's better ways to use your time. But, you know, I mean, just, you know, I think that if the truth is the, the truth is interesting and, and um, you know, I mean, it's. I think all of us have a basic desire to really understand what's going on, and, and so um, someone who, who rejects the science, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell them. I don't think there is an easy answer to that question. They say uh, you've got to work on the 80% the of all people, whether they're Republican or the most progressive Democrats, they will agree on 80% of things. And there's a really interesting piece interesting. by <laughs> a Senator Franken who's like, sometimes it's not 80%, sometimes it's 60%, sometimes it's 2%, but if you can find that 2%, then you can make progress. Now, if people want to hear more about the human network or how we can create connections, how we can connect with each other, where can they find your work? Yeah, so the human network is the world's first global democratized think tank, and it's launching on January 1st, 2018, and you can find it at onehumanfuture.com, O-N-E, humanfuture.com. Um, we'll have a link in the description. Yeah, and um, and my, my work you can find, uh, my, my memoir is called Girl in the Woods, and it's the story of when I was 19, I walked from Mexico all the way to Canada, and it's a, it's a memoir of, of that hike and um, what happened and what I discovered. Um, and you can read an excerpt of that in the New York Times called A Hiker's Guide to Healing. Which is definitely worth a read. I was reading it on Thank the train you. on the way in. Thank you. And Mike, you write about the most amazing stories in the environment. If people are interested in the environment and they want to be able to learn more, where can they find your work? Well, certainly at mongabay.com, M-O-N-G-A-B-A-Y.com. Uh, yeah, I'm writing there daily. And, and our podcast is a bi-weekly podcast. Every two weeks comes out. And that's just at mongabay.com slash podcast. Links in the description, everyone. Well, I was so glad to have you both come on to talk about not just the hard research, but also how we can make people care about it and make it relate to people and how we can relate to each other. So thank you both for coming on. Thank you so much, Jade. This was awesome. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Jade. Hi, everyone. I'm Jade Lovell, resident science nerd on the Young Turks Network. You're watching SciQ, and we know you don't want to miss an episode. So please click the subscribe button down below.